Hello, friends. It's me, your best buddy, Kirill Nesterov. And with me today, I have a Canadian tanky Maoist communist Antifa super soldier who goes by the online handle Forced. Hello. We're going to have a discussion about communism, about the nature of communism, about forced real life, as well as online experiences with various communist movements in Canada and uh, in general in English speaking world. So, Forst, tell us a little about yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? And uh, how old are you? Well, th those, are, those are pretty personal. That, that could totally be used to track me down. Um, let's say I am in my 30s. I am from Eastern Canada. Mm, the better part of Canada. Yeah, it is. It's the more populated part, so it's the more developed. Mm. We just got fib fiber optic internet here just last year. But yeah, I was uh, I I am a former activist. Mm. I'd say former because I haven't really done anything in a while. You're talking about real life activism, not online. Yeah, mm. yeah, real life activism. This is a very important distinction because, of course, online everybody is a fucking activist. That's true. That's true. Yeah, no, I actually I actually went out and I was in protests and marches and. I I fought police and was in riots and mm. and all that good romantic kind of shit. Were you wearing that black mask that they wear in Black Block or whatever the fuck it's called? I had. Or is that a different uh, faction? Um, oh fuck, they're all they're all so intertwined at this point that like they're all they're all the same basically. Mm. But no, my uh, my favorite was a uh, the ski mask that was in um, camo print. It was a camo print ski mask. That was my uh, that was my shit. Mm, mm. back in the day that sounds like something from like fallout new vegas yeah it does actually i was going for um uh at the time i was inspired by like all these these pictures on on websites like uh what was it called Li well what was live live leak before it was live leak fuck i don't remember some gore something or some shit like gore sites where like it would show fucking crazy islamists this is before well just after 9 11 mm. of like paramilitary dudes fighting governments in like ski masks and shit that was that was my i remember using one of these sites to watch uh, footage of georgian war in uh 2008 yeah but yeah that was that was where i came i i, I romanticized the idea of being like a rebel mm. a rebel fighter that was around 10 years ago right that was like a long time yeah. ago yeah and yeah. a lot of things changed since then a lot of things changed for communism for example back then communism was genuinely marginal ideology nobody took seriously of course nowadays non-authoritarian version of communism seems to be absolutely exploding in popularity both online as well as in real life they do a lot of real life activism including let's just say violent activism in fact um i remember two years ago i was watching a youtube video of richard spencer who is of course one of the leaders of the alt-right who pretty much admitted that antifa efforts are so effective that he had to cancel his uh real life uh, demonstrations his real life uh, speeches that he was planning on doing so yeah a lot of things changed in uh, 10 years they have i almost don't recognize the movement um but i actually think that's a good thing that i don't recognize yeah. it. back when i was an activist what what kind of alienated me or 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 demotivated me and made me an ex-activist was the fact that no one no one seemed to be doing the right thing like everyone was an old guard mm. everyone was an old guard set in their ways old style communist activist um the group i was part of their leadership were, were all activists from like the 80s and 90s and they had a certain way of doing things and a certain way of organizing and a certain way of talking that was just so kind of dogmatic and felt completely separated from reality you were actually involved with a maoist group not even a tanky not even like a garden variety genocidal tanky but an actual maoist with a much much more impressive kill count <laughs> yes that's that's part of the reason because i when i was first exploring my my inner communist <laughs> i came upon all these groups i did my research and like there's the, the stalinist like uh communist party of canada they were they were way too boring mm. for me like i needed more i needed more pizzazz more action <laughs> and the most crazy version i could find were the maoists and their like idea of actually launching a guerrilla war in canada right now <laughs> and i was like that's my shit that's totally my shit did you have any problems with police i did well not outside of protests uh, of course at protests and marches and stuff we'd organize everything from trying to have big marches in the middle of downtown um montreal i'll say i'm from the 
the Montreal area. Mm. We'd uh, we'd have protests in the middle of, of downtown, and then we'd also go out to like these small little towns where like a factory was closing, and then we'd have like a dozen people, and we'd have a dozen cops escorting us mm. as well. And sometimes they'd start shit, and sometimes one time they decided to confiscate all our equipment. Did you get to fight actual fascists ever? Yes, I did. There were two. There were two big occasions. The first, or maybe it was the second. I don't know. Chronologically speaking, but the first, most important or biggest was the uh, security and prosperity partnership protest, which I think was 2006, 2007, something like that. It was mm-hmm. it was Bush era. It was really my first real taste of the life of an activist. It was in this little town called Montebello, Quebec, which is like a this nice ski resort town with this big chateau that they were having. It was uh, Bush and whoever the Canadian prime minister was at the time. I don't remember if it was Harper. Or... So it basically was the old style anti-globalist protest before the yeah. term anti-globalist yeah. got hijacked by braid bar types. Yeah, exactly. It was, uh, we, everyone was under the banner of anti-capitalism mm-hmm. and anti-globalism. And there were actually, who's that, that old, like, Kind of like the, the the libertarian version of Bernie Sanders. Who was he? Is he still alive? Uh, Ron Paul. Like in the States? Yeah. Ron Paul. Yeah, there were Ron Paul people there. He is still publishing articles on his think tank website. But yeah, I saw some people with uh, with Ron Paul signs at this protest. That's how that's how fucking archaic and in the past it was. But yeah, I got um, I, I had a tussle with the police. They tried to take my flag <laughs> and I wrestled with some of them. And then and then I won. I, I kept my flag and they got angry and shot me with a beanbag gun. Was that the hammer and sickle flag? Yeah, it was well as a red flag. What we did, we all went with red flags, except instead of just like a shitty flagpole, we attached them to two by fours. You just used uh, the old style uh, communist flags, not that, not the anarcho communist one, uh, red and black, right? No, no, we were we were red because we also had some differences of opinion with the anarcho communists and the anarchists. Tankies and anarchists always fight each other online. Yeah, they do. (laughs) I guess some things never change. But yeah, um, I got I got the whole pepper spray and tear gas in the eyes and got shot with a beanbag gun nice <laughs> and it was all good i had like a i had a big bruise they he aimed for my fucking balls i turned sideways to take it on the hip but he was aiming for my fucking jewels i know it if this was 2006 this is around the time i was participating in anti-putin protests here in moscow and i almost broke my leg at one of them nice. i was running away from police jumping fucking fences and so on it was pretty dramatic and funny but yeah other than that i went to some mayday demonstrations that kind of got a little a little little dicey uh i saw some you know we had this rally where it was supposed to be family friendly and there were you know mothers with babies and wheelchairs and shit getting tear gassed just clouds of tear gas it was almost apocalyptic that's not even in the u.s it's just no that wasn't actually honestly canada has always been a little bit more violent in protests than the u.s until maybe until recently yeah until recently until Hmm. the alt-right came and now there are race wars in the streets race well there isn't there isn't really a race wars At least not anymore. Maybe, maybe like in 2016, there was something, but yeah, I'll try it. It's not that capable on the street, especially since uh, Trump isn't really protecting them. Anyway, um, what is communism? Communism is a far left materialist ideology whose adherents believe that a better society would be structured around common ownership of the means of production and the absence of social classes, money and the state. But of course, in real life, communism is uh, something else for for everyone. It's uh, different things to different people. What faction do you currently are you currently sympathizing with the most? There are of course different factions. There are Sugdems, there are tankies, there are anarchists, there are Antifa super soldiers or whatever. All of them have one goal, and that is to commit white genocide. Which which one of these guilds do you like the most? Um, which one of these guilds? I don't know. I kind of consider myself a pan communist but at the same time <laughs> intersectional yes i'm an intersectional pan communist <laughs> anti soldier um no but i don't know i've gone through a lot of different phases in my life like when i first started out when i was a young teenager back when my family was still fucking rich we were like comfortably middle class and had a nice big house with a big lawn up in some posh suburb mm, suburban living yeah mm-hmm. yeah it was suburban living back then i kind of delved into the other side of the political spectrum basically i was an edgy teenager pretending that uh, i was this suave like fascist sympathizing fucking hardcore 
kid. <laughs> That's weird. You are Anglo ethnicity, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I'm I'm 100 white. Yeah, and this town I was in that I lived in at the time was like 99.9 percent white, mm. and I was a comfortable white kid who still kind of had this this burning passion inside to like fuck shit up and be a rebel. <laughs> and surrounded by white people, my version of rebellion was to like be a Nazi and draw swastikas in my school books and shit. I moved to the city, like right into the middle of the gay village, and it was a total fucking culture shock. But eventually, I came out of it on the opposite end of the spectrum. I met like a black girl in school. Uh, we fell in love. Oh, yada yada. Oh, white genocide committing. <laughs> yeah, I know. And that's that's when it began. That's when it began. And I realized that this feeling I had inside of me was not originally i can look back and and see that i drew swastikas in my book and tried to be all edgy and hardcore because i felt powerless mm. and i thought that white supremacy because i was white made me feel powerful it made me feel powerful in a time of my life well when i felt powerless and i think that's what draws a lot of nazis mm. to being nazis but anyway then i moved to the city met a black girl Everything changed. My whole perspective changed. You got cured. Decided to devote myself to the destruction of the white race. <laughs> Excellent. 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 So basically, basically, the new cool way of saying white genocide is mayocide or myocide. I don't know how to pronounce that correctly. Mayocide. Yeah, it's a systematic destruction of the white race, either through interracial marriage or outright violence. Also known as white genocide, but maybe the word mayocide is exclusively used by those who support why it's going extinct. That's the urban dictionary definition of the word. Let's get to practical questions. So why genocide? Like, how are you guys planning to kill all those white people? Because there is just so fucking many of them and they live for a fucking long time. They have crazy fucking high life expectancy, uh, especially in Western Europe and in America, not so much in Eastern Europe, but, you know, are Eastern Europeans white even? That's still up for debate. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, I guess there are always war camps and gulags, but like, you know, is it even possible? possible to build a gulag that big where, where are you gonna bury all the bodies like these are important logistical questions okay basically to answer that question i think communists i think being a communist means that you've adopted a certain a certain strategy for the destruction of the white race and that is destroying its method of power mm -hmm. white people their power comes from capitalism they're kind of like i don't know it's kind of like sauron and the ring mm -hmm. destroy capitalism and you will destroy white people like destroy the system in which cap uh, white people control the world and the natural order a natural balance will come in which the white people will be wiped out <laughs> because honestly white people are the most destructive force on this planet since the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs but what about non-white ethnicities who are also good at capitalism like east asians for example chinese japanese koreans they're okay with it but even their version of capitalism isn't as fucking fucked up as white people like i like to like like the whole the holocaust and, and world war ii and all that mm. and a lot of people are like well genocide happens like even you know black people africans there's lots of genocides in africans well yeah or like you know japanese genociding the chinese and so on yeah that's true but i think what happened during the holocaust like like white people genocide is on a whole other level to like how everyone else commits genocide they industrialized it and they were extremely efficient in it whereas like in africa a genocide is just a bunch of people running around with machetes chopping up a bunch of other people mm -hmm. yeah. and that's horrible but it's not like world ending mm -hmm. i forget what the original question was <laughs> what is your strategy for committing the genocide basically Honestly, I think that might be a two birds with one stone situation. Mm -hmm. Like the human body has a lot of potential energy in it. If we could find out how to use them as fuel <laughs> to replace like coal and oil. Matrix uh, human farms, they didn't look very ecologically friendly to me. Yeah, well, that's what I'm thinking is like kind of, I mean, what is coal? Mm. Coal is just extremely ancient petrified biological matter oh i get it so we just kill all the white people then we bury them underground then we wait for like i don't know like a few million years and then, <laughs> then. and then yes exactly there's our new source of oil it's interesting see that's what we communists do we we try to find solutions to the world's problems yeah long-term solutions long term we're thinking uh the long game hmm. so have you seen uh the new quote-unquote it's not really new it's like fucking six months old anti-fascist mascot gritty 
I think originally he was the official mascot for the Philadelphia Flyers National Hockey League. Yeah, I, I saw that and I didn't get it. I don't understand. And I think this is the whole problem with like the left not being able to make proper memes. I think it's ridiculous nonsense. I think the left is so much better at memes than right wingers, to be honest. I disagree, mainly because of the way social justice culture has kind of taken over a lot of the left and identity politics mm. has kind of weaseled its way. So you're skeptical of the ID poll? I am. I'm pretty skeptical of it because I'm like back in back in my day, back in my day, communists were all about anti-capitalism. Like that, that was it. That was, we were all focused on like the economic enemy mm-hmm. who controlled the world behind the scenes. Civil rights and, you know, gay rights and identity politics, it's on the same page. We're fighting the same fight. Mm-hmm. But I think it kind of takes away from the important battle. And you can view ID poll as a way of radicalizing centrist liberals, essentially, as a way of putting them on the same side effectively as you without brainwashing them with communist radiation or something. <laughs> Yeah, I actually thought of that too, that like it is for what it's worth been a good a good way of, of radicalizing a lot of people. Yeah. My view, sort of philosophical view of this is that to change the world, you need to engage in effective politics and to engage in effective politics, you need to build very broad coalitions that consists of all kinds of people intersectionally, pardon my French, that, uh, you know, inevitably will have different points of view on what's important. It's sometimes hard to get into other people experience and to understand things from their point of view. But without doing that, you're not going to build a coalition. And without building a coalition, you're not actually going to change the world. Yeah, I agree with that. But there's also some other things um, that I kind of differentiate, diverge a little bit from that. First of all, is that even historically, communists have always kind of been eager to turn on other kind of movements that they've allied with, like during the Russian Revolution, how long did it take for the Bolsheviks to eventually turn on, uh, you know, like during the Kronstadt Rebellion, and, yeah. and on the anarchists and all that? Yeah. And the communists and anarchists, they're basically the fucking same. In practice, yes. It's just the tankies use a different kind of aesthetic and they uh, have slightly different uh, set of honestly irrelevant beliefs because it doesn't actually matter what you think about some facts of Russian history. Yeah, well, so going back, I think a lot of communists today... A lot of old guard communists, like the um, like the group that I used to be affiliated with, the, uh, the 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 party, they actually had a split a couple of years ago in true communist fucking fashion. What happened was there, I don't know, there was some drama about some sexual assault allegation oh. between some members, mm-hmm. and eventually, it, or quite quickly actually, it di- it devolved into the old guard versus like the new guard. It was the old guard core who created the party versus the new core of people who had joined basically after I had left. The old guard were basically like, look, identity politics, you know, it is an important battle. But ultimately, it's just one small part of the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Whereas the new guard they had a, a weird name for them, but um, they thought that it was worth basically putting all their effort into each and every identity politic issue at every, you know, civil rights issue. That's more practical, honestly, to do that. Another problem with, um, let's just say it, economic leftism, the original form of Marxism that talks primarily about economic issues, it can get very abstract very fast. Messages that are abstract, that use this complicated philosophical languages that talk about fucking Marxian interpretation of Hegelian dialectics or whatever, that is not necessarily the most convincing kind of political message in the world. I agree completely. Like I think that dogmatic lexicon of fucking basically smelling your own fart kind of liberalism, liberal elitism is so rampant in the communist movement where these people throw around these terms like they're fucking intellectuals like you know dialectalism and materialism material conditions and blah 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 the old marxian terms yeah to be honest there is this uh, intellectual base behind communism that is a legitimate philosophy that can get very hard to uh, to dig through to understand it is complicated and it's used by a lot of communists as kind of like a badge of honor where like oh i've read this and this and i understand this and you obviously don't mm-hmm. um you obviously you need to you need to reevaluate the dialectic material conditions of this before you you know become come up with a better praxis and blah 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 and all this just kind of it, it got to the point where attending these these meetings and with this party it, it felt like going to church <laughs> it felt like going to church and being preached about having to be godly or dialectical 
with everything. And it, it was just, it got incredibly dogmatic. But at the same time, my overall opinion of identity politics is that I, I personally don't really agree with them. I don't agree with the old guard needing to stick to the the dogma of books written to 150 years ago and whatever the fuck Mark said, because things change and things have changed. To be fair, there are a lot of modern intellectuals who uh, do Marxian analysis, including like Zoomers and young millennials. So, you know, there is no shortage of leftist intellectuals these days, to be honest. Yeah, no, I don't think there is either. But I think in terms of identity politics, I think they're not issues in and of themselves. They're not, it's it's a complicated issue that I really haven't wrapped my head around. Because yes, in one point, it is important to fight for marginalized people who are literally being marginalized right now. But at the same time, knowing that once you win that battle, that's not it. And I think a lot of people go into it thinking that they just need to get gay marriage legalized or they need to mm-hmm. fight this one specific battle and then they kind of peter out. Well, these people are usually referred to as lib shits. One of the strangest things about the way discourse evolves is that the word lib shit, three or four years ago, it, it's, it was used exclusively by neo-reactionaries and then uh, the alt-writers. Yeah. But these days, it's, it's used primarily by leftists on like fucking Chapo subreddits and, you know, so on. It's just weird. I can see how it can be weird looking from the outside in, but as a communist who's been involved with the movement, there's always been this underlying hatred of liberals that almost rivals hatred of the right. Personally, me, like take the, the whole when Trump was elected, I was almost rooting for Trump over fucking Hillary. Uh, a lot of leftists, leftists, not liberal leftists, not center leftists, but leftists, they made this uh, argument that the accelerationist argument, I like to call it, Zizek was actually the one making this point that Trump is going to fuck up so bad that uh, this will radicalize the libs, radicalize a lot of uh, people with left-wing sympathies in US, which will eventually cause a counter-reaction. I guess that's sort of a dialectical way of looking at things. Trump is a moron. He pretty much did fuck all to actually, um, he didn't really do anything his base wanted him to do. He is not popular. And um, now we have politicians like uh, AOC and uh, Ilhan Omar, who are essentially to the left of Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is no longer a radical on American political scene. He is just a garden variety suck them now. Yeah, and that's a fact that I fucking, I cherish. Um, I love AOC. Like, first of all, she's pretty damn cute. Second of all, just what she represents actually getting elected, actually becoming part of mainstream politics. And she, I thought, I was worried originally that she'd have she'd have a good campaign and everyone would be like, oh yeah, she fucking, and then she would just vanish into the mountains of bureaucracy of the American political system. But she's actually stayed relevant. Yeah, she is genociding boomers on Twitter like every day. Yeah, and, and it's like that gives me a little sparkle of hope. Like that that brings a little bit of a beat to my cold dead heart <laughs> that this can actually happen. And I actually, it's funny that you mentioned Zizek because that's what actually got me into Zizek was Trump being elected and me thinking that that it was good for him to be elected because he's gonna. He was a wrecking ball into the American political scene. Like First, he wrecked the neocons. Then he yeah. humiliated the Dems. And then he humiliated his own fucking base. I personally thought, like exactly what Zizek said, that this is this this could be the catalyst that is necessary. Mm-hmm. Like things might have to get worse before they get better. And I also agree that Trump really hasn't done anything. Yeah. I mean, honestly, his policies, he hasn't, haven't changed that much from Obama. He's kind of a cretin and kind of impotent. He is. <laughs> the only thing he really did was that tax break. That's like not even... What people care about, either the right or the left. No one gives a shit. Yeah, nobody elected that orange slut for a fucking tax break. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what he is. He's just a catalyst that he has lo- led to a lot of radicalization on both sides, unfortunately, though. You know, uh, American presidents almost always get reelected, but Trump might actually fuck that up somehow. Like, it's, there, is an, there is a real possibility. Although the release of impotent uh, Mueller report, I think, strengthened him a little bit. That insane uh, Russiagate scandal, I think it might actually end up making Trump stronger and not weaker. I agree with this, too. I mean... What's your take on uh, protocols of elders of Kremlin that is a a new fascination well not not new anymore it's like two years old now but it's a fascination among uh, the shit libs it's it's an obsession it's not just a fascination there are genuinely people out there rational centrist liberal free-thinking open-minded people who have become frothing warmongers don't forget the race science like the 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 slav skull analysis the untrustworthiness (laughs) of, of, of your russian neighbor 
Okay. The thing is, like, I remember, I remember, I watched the the U.S. elections pretty closely. Like, I, I had my finger on the pulse a little bit. Everyone fucking did. It was a big thing. I remember the Democrat National Convention and what happened. Like, I remember... That's when the emails were released. No, what I'm actually talking about is how the DNC committee basically backstabbed Bernie. Bernie oh, yeah, was... Yeah the more popular candidate. He was more popular than fucking Hillary. And basically, in a move to save their neoliberal establishment asses, they took a hard right and chose Hillary over Bernie. And that pissed off so many people on the left, even even centrists, like even, you know, socialists, social democrats, sock dems and all that. Yes, it pissed off a lot of people. And that is why they lost. Hillary's uninspiring campaign didn't motivate enough people to show up in voting places. Trump won several states by razor thin margins, basically. Like we're talking about a few thousand votes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Hillary, like again, harking back to fucking Bush in 2000, Hillary got mo- more popular vote. That's because of uh, California. Yeah, I think people on the left are more susceptible to disenfranchisement when they see shit like that than people on the right. Like people on the right will show up to vote because they're stupid people who think their votes matter. We'll see in two years how it's going to be. Well, the thing is, I think it's going to be a lot of this. I think it's going to be the same kind of thing. I think like what I was trying to bring up before was when this whole Russiagate thing started because Democrats realized that they fucked up hard. Mm -hmm. Hillary was literally the only person who could possibly have lost an election to Donald fucking Trump. (laughs) Like it's, it's, I mean, there's, there's so many memes about like people falling into a coma in like 2012 and waking up now and being like how fucked <laughs> things are. But I think the whole Russiagate thing started because I remember right after the elections, right after the, the national convention, um, the Democrat national convention, how, how disenfranchised a lot of people were, how pissed off the word Hillary and how Bernie was thrown under the bus and all this. And mm-hmm. This was going through all the things. But then as soon as, as soon as Hillary lost in the election, the narrative came out about Russiagate and how Russians fucking puppeteered the election, like these masterminds. The piss tape, man. I am a piss tape truther. Yeah, it's, it looks like they are true, but it's funny that there are just so many liberals who honestly think that Trump is literally a Russian agent. He's literally taking orders. Like, he literally gets phone calls from Putin to carry out his orders. Putin so politically impotent that he can't influence fucking election in neighboring Belarus that is like fucking 95% relies on Russia for everything. Russia is one of the most impotent nations from when it comes to any kind of soft power. The the idea that Russia can control the United States president, it's... It's absurd. It's fucking absurd, especially not only what you said about Russia, but the fact that you, the United States is the preeminent fucking authority yes, exactly. on soft power and on behind the scenes fucking puppeteering of politics around the world. Yes, including messing with Russian politics many times. Everybody uh, brings up this example when uh, Americans got involved in Yeltsin's re-election. Of course, Yeltsin presided over one of the largest collapses of uh, living standards in human history (laughs) like how many people died because of that do you think it's hard to quantify but it's possible that hundreds of thousands of people eventually prematurely died because of that economic catastrophe because of the collapse americans have no shame basically that's what i'm saying no they have no shame and it's it's funny that the whole uh the whole shit in ukraine that happened uh in like 2014 or whatever it was where literally amer like literally the fucking like secretary of state of united states was visiting Ukraine to like organ help organize and work with the coup organizers or whatever. John McCain, fucking almighty John McCain was literally on the streets of Kiev and that leaked phone call with Victoria Newland and, and the, the US ambassador to, to the Ukraine. I almost don't blame Americans for this just because what happened in Ukraine was a complete failure of Russian soft power. Like the situation should have never deteriorated to this level. Yeah, that's true. But the point I was getting to was that like the US meddled in Ukraine and then a couple of years later, suddenly Russia is meddling in the US or it's just a bunch of like Russian trollers and troll farms apparently posting shit yeah posting memes and posting on Twitter and shit and like suddenly the end of the yeah. fucking world has cometh and fucking liberals they've become warmongering fucking psychopaths who are like <laughs> fucking let's start the bombs dudes like it's time for another intervention mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when 9-11 happened Bush bombed Iraq but when 2016 election happened Donald Trump didn't do anything because he's a pussy yeah. He's a coward. Yeah, exactly. Didn't even bomb Moscow. <laughs> exactly. It's fucked. But yeah, the whole reason I think Russiagate exists is it's them trying to control the narrative and protect their asses and protect their base and their 
foundation of power. Well, yeah, it exists because Russians are so dehumanized and it's okay to hate them. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that a long time coming, like even before the election. I don't know when exactly it changed, but there used to be like during the early 2000s, like post 9-11, immediate post 9-11, there was like this romanticization about Putin. Like there were Putin memes going around the internet about how manly a man he was. And everyone kind of had those like, oh yeah, Russians are, they're, they're cute and they're cool and stuff. It's sort of like strange because in some ways things got worse. Certainly among the liberals, racism towards Russians is basically mainstream. Yeah. On the other hand, when interacting with Westerners online, I'm encountering a lot less racism, certainly a lot less casual racism now than five years ago, and certainly a lot less than 10 years ago. Like, remember when, when we were playing Eve, communicating with all these people in online space, racism was just normal. But I feel now it's much better. I think that was more just a side effect of Eve itself and how the game was designed and how there were alliances grouped up more or less around national or ethnic kind of lines. Just And again, even then, it was more due to like the time differences and, and shit like that. Yeah, but again, another example I can make are pseudo-historical games like World of Tanks. Remember when World of Tanks got released in the West, it was basically full of fucking Soviet truthers who didn't understand anything about the history of World War II. They were very heavily biased towards the Nazis, you know? Yeah. They thought that everything Soviet was like a fabrication because they, they didn't have that knowledge. The Russian bias culture, that's how I call it, uh, ironically, you know, in air quotes, Russian bias. Uh, but that is mostly gone. Well, yeah, because I mean, I guess you could think of it as that was back in their 90s and 2000s and stuff. I feel like an average nerd, an average person on the internet, he has more realistic attitude towards Russia and towards Soviet Union. But yeah, liberals are, I guess it was just strange to see that people who constructed their uh, political identity around human rights. Yeah. It was so easy for them to switch to aggressive, fucking violent racism. <laughs> yeah. But like, again, I don't think that has anything really to do with some inherent... Well, I think maybe the Cold War, the whole undercurrent of constant Soviet Union fear-mongering. The general lack of soft power, or the lack of charismatic leaders on Russian side. Yeah. Russians themselves don't really know how to deal with these problems, how to, you know, combat international racism. The whole thing about, like, liberals suddenly becoming frothmouth warmongering racists. I've seen it in other, other kind of forms, too. It's like so-called so social justice warriors fucking resorting to like trolling people to kill themselves and shit they attack right wingers but not leftists oh yeah oh they do they do mm. like I said before real leftists like communists and stuff hate liberals but liberals also hate communists <laughs> almost as much I mean the whole that whole meme about how liberals are like oh one group wants to kill all the Jews and the other group wants to stop them they're the same the enlightened centrist meme yes yeah the enlightened centrist meme um, where they will turn on you I don't know if it's just a, a a parable about human nature or how just philosophically and morally bankrupt liberalism actually is, it, it, it doesn't take much. Well, still, liberals and leftists have some things in common, but liberals and the far right, they have almost nothing in common, well, at least in practice. Communists make this argument that actually liberalism turns to fascism, you know, in crisis moments to save capitalism or whatever. Maybe there is some degree of truth to that, but so far, when the alt-right became a thing, liberals certainly didn't ally with it. In fact, they essentially destroyed it. That's what happened. They removed it from social media. They removed it from the news websites. The alt-righters, they got deplatformed. They got attacked by media. They got doxxed by media. A lot of people got their lives destroyed and so on and so forth. Yeah, I do agree. Um, liberals as just a, a nebulous concept of, of the population. A lot of them radicalized after after Trump. I think that, that argument from communists that you just mentioned about liberals flocking to fascism when capitalism is threatened. It's kind of a, a trope, but I think on an issue by issue basis, it becomes more true. It's not just a trope because, for example, I I know a dozen people probably who were liberals, but they got radicalized and become alt writers in 2015 ish era because of Gamergate. <laughs> 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 that's a legit pipeline, gamer to Nazi. That's a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like what I'm trying to get to is that when a person is confronted that their identity that they've come to accept about themselves is wrong or something that they're doing is wrong, they have two choices. They can either accept that they might be wrong or they can double down on the fact that they're right and the other person is wrong. So men, the whole gamer girl gate bullshit, mm -hmm. a lot of guys, a lot of guys, maybe even most guys were like, yeah, there's there's some legitimacy to, to the way, you know, we need to look at the way women are treated in, in gaming culture. But then there's some guys who were like, I've never done anything wrong. I'm not a sexist. Fuck 
fuck women like completely without realization of the irony like a lot of people when confronted like black lives matter a lot of liberal white people will become defensive when you try to tell them that they're part of a system that is oppressing people they'll go into the whole racism doesn't exist anymore and that eventually morphs into oh you're the racist what you're describing basically is the audience of channels like Sargon of Akkad but of course these people are not fascist not at all they're just sort of centrists perhaps even center left kind of sort of well Sargon has so many feuds with Nazis online he probably has more conflicts with Nazis than he does with uh, liberals so yeah that's true but at the same time most Nazis weren't Nazis most of the you know the German people weren't Nazis but they still rose to power and they still eventually through a sequence of events found themselves shooting Jews in the back of the head in a ditch somewhere in fucking Eastern Europe even though you know five ten years before that they were enlightened liberal centrists it doesn't take much to push people either way. I heard this argument as well that Hitler started with just a few dozen people, so did Mussolini. But again, I can sort of make a counter argument that there have been comprehensive studies and really the United States has only, I think, slightly more than 10 million people who have alt-right beliefs. Yeah, that's true. Those 10 million people can still do a lot of damage. Those 10 million people, if you look at who they actually are, a large majority of them are police, members of the military, former members of the military. These are the people, you who actually have the training, who form these these fucking ridiculous militias where they basically cosplay soldiers on their weekends shooting guns at human-shaped targets. My impression is that most of them are just internet nerds and needs on welfare. So. Most of them are. But then how many of those became like, uh, what was that bomber guy in Florida? Fucking Una Boomer? Yeah. The- <laughs> <laughs> How many became him or the the shooter in in New Zealand? Honestly, New Zealand is legitimately a very special case because I analyzed five biggest acts of right-wing terrorism in the U.S. for a project the other day. And he is legitimately unique that uh, Tarant, I think was his name. I think he got radicalized on far-right spaces and the chance on image boards because most of the other terrorists, they were just cretins. They were boomers who fucking read too much Ben Shapiro and decided to attack Muslims or something. But that guy, he is really special. I wonder if it's the start of a new trend in terrorism. Well, I don't think it's new. Like, I don't, I honestly don't see any differentiation between him and, you know, going back to Anders Brebeck. Age and style. He is 20 something, while the other terrorists are usually 30 something or even 40 something. And he used internet memes in his manifesto. He's more effective. He's probably more intelligent than your average shooter. It might be a sign that uh, the younger generation is radicalizing. I, I think that sign has been around for a while. Like, I don't remember how old Anders Brevik was when he, um, where was that, Norway, somewhere in Scandinavia? Yeah. Then there was the, the incel warrior in California. There was uh, a van attack in Toronto. And that guy was pretty young, I think. There was the... The, the Toronto attacker was incel. He wasn't a white nationalist. No, no, he was an incel, but I, I think there's a lot of overlap there. The Venn diagram looks funny between, you know, incel <laughs> and white nationalist. It's almost a circle, but it's not a complete circle because legitimately... No, it's not a complete circle. There are a lot of uh, incels who are African, who are Asian, of course, and who are like Armenian, you know, like not really white. Yeah, well, I think the Toronto guy wasn't white. The uh, the guy who shot up the gay club in, in Florida... I don't think he was white either. And that was weird. Like, wasn't, I, I don't know. I heard a lot of stories where he was like a patron at this bar. Like he went there to pick up guys, but then he got rejected. So he decided to kill all the gays or some shit. Gay and so. But yeah, like you said, the Venn diagram is almost a circle. And uh, I think that fact can't be discounted. Like, you know, there's that whole ancient saying of fool me twice. Can't get fooled again. That George Bush fucked up. The George Bush saying. Yeah, the George Bush saying. <laughs> and also just other more, well, things that don't get reported in the news quite as much but to me still ring a lot of alarm bells like that vigilante militia group who basically kidnapped like 300 immigrants trying to cross the border yeah i've seen the video recently it was kind of weird i'm not even sure though what are they expecting if they're going to release them to the government then the government should just let them go that's what these people think they put authority into themselves and they think that they're an extension of the government like that's kind of where fascism gets its foot soldiers what state that was in oh fuck what was that 
that in. I don't know. Was it like Texas or something or Arizona? I'm just asking because you're saying that this is how fascism starts, but Texas is probably going to flip in like a few years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's not even new. Like I remember reading back in the 2000s when I first started being a communist, first started being an activist, hearing about the, the Michigan militia. And that's kind of always been a part of American culture, at least since the 80s, at least since the post-Vietnam era. I remember reading a huge SPLC material on an American militias, because again, I was working on a project. And basically, during Obama years, these militias were proliferating at an amazing rate. I guess people got panicked because of the gay Muslim terrorist Barack Hussein Obama and his fake <laughs> certificate. He is going to commit white genocide. A lot of white boomers were panicking about that. Yeah, they got spooked. Yeah, since then, Obama militarized the police. And essentially, these militias are kind of not really a factor anymore. At least they're not quite as important as they were in, in Obama years. I disagree. I think they're more important now. I mean, like we already talked about, Trump hasn't really changed anything. The laws haven't changed in the United States. Nothing's on paper has changed, but culturally. What actually changes is the passage of time and people are becoming older and people are dying and old uh, white boomers who consistently, reliably vote Republican. They're dying off. Yeah, they are, but they're also being replaced with uh, maybe not fully, but I think right-wing ideology is not going to die out with the boomers. There's a lot of, I get, what are they, Gen Y? Gen Y and early millennials even. People around my age who are kind of embracing the whole white-centric political viewpoint? Yes, but people our age and uh, Gen Z, uh, Zoomers, again, I've seen, I think, a Pew study about that. They are embracing leftist ideologies faster than they are embracing the right-wing ideologies. No, that I agree with. I'd also counter with the argument that uh, Germany was also in the process of liberalizing. My understanding is that the Nazis came to power in Germany almost by accident. They did, because basically all they had back then was like just horrible economic depression shit going on. And there was a lot of conflict between the socialists and the Nazis. And that's where the whole communist trope of liberals choosing fascism when shit hits the fan comes from, I think. Um, I know comparing modern America to 1930s Germany is a f overplayed trope. Mm, yeah. But I think there's still some wisdom to be had there in, in how people as a demographic, as a population, cope with change, cope with hardship. And I know demographically, white supremacy and right wing mentality is diminishing. But at the same time, they still hold the reins of power. They're still the ones who control the military. They're still the ones with the organization and the resolve to really start doing shit. I'm having a hard time conceptualizing a realistic scenario where the United States military can somehow go rogue or like join the Nazis. Certainly this cannot happen with uh, the Nazi organizations that exist right now. The far right will have to invent a completely new, a more powerful, more influential, more persuasive organization, build it from the ground down up essentially and they don't have much time <laughs> yeah that's true like i'm not talking about uh, an alt-right coup over the United States government. I'm more focused on the overlap between various right-wing elements in like just the fabric of American culture, the prevalence of gun culture and the police and the militarization of the police and the enormously ridiculous military industrial complex. I'm using finger quotes that you can't see right now because I know it's again an overused trope, but I think there's a lot of overlap between all that and I don't think it would take much to push it over the edge. Like you said, Hitler came to power accidentally. And I don't think there's anyone, well, there probably are, there probably are idiots actively trying to take over the government or thinking that. Yeah, the Q patriots. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's more a matter of it could happen as, like in Germany, kind of accidentally. Just to return to a point that I made early in this discussion, to change the world, you need to engage in successful politics. And to engage in successful politics, you need to organize, you need to communicate with people, you need to create a message that other people want to hear, you need to solve their problems, you know. And that's not really something right-wingers are doing, or they haven't yet displayed any capacity or interest in doing something like this. I don't think the far right, the modern far right in America is really capable of engaging in effective politics. They really need to look inside themselves and somehow reinvent themselves if they want to be successful. Anyway, uh, one anecdote that I want to end this conversation on is that a few years ago, I went on a web forum called Free Republic, which is a horrible, fucking terrible boomer conservative forum where a bunch of boomers meet and complain about Obama and uh, fucking Muslim occupation government 
government or whatever birth certificate shit. You know, I guess Russiagate is kind of like a liberal birth certificate. Anyway, so there was some insane boomer who was uh, complaining about Soviet Union. He was complaining about Stalin, but he curiously misspelled Stalin as Stalin with ing in the end. So I think Stalin should be adapted as a cool way of saying Stalin. All tankies, take note. <laughs> Stalin. Oh my God. Anyway, man. All right. Good talk. Talk to you later. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man.